Holy here. We are back. Hope everybody had a uh, nice little unplug session for the All-Star break. Um, and here we are back on a Friday big 14-game main slate. Um, really across the industry, just missing the one slightly earlier game. I uh, got a couple of question marks on the mound here. Um, floating around. I don't know why we can't just... You know, after four days off, why we can't just announce a starting pitcher. But uh, here we are. Um, no idea what Toronto's doing. Uh, officially, they haven't announced Chris Bassett. I do have him here because most of the industry does have him projected. So we're just going to go with him for now. Um, who else do we have down here? Mackenzie Gore. I've got him in the sheet. There's a couple of spots around the industry that have Trevor Williams in here. So no official announced starter yet for Washington either. We've got a lot of uh, weather concerns in this game, so it might not matter all that much. Um, and lastly, I think it's uh, Oakland down here. Now, most everybody does have pl Paul Blackburn here in um, in their projections, and so I've got him in the sheet here as well. So that's kind of where we're going to start with things. Um, and, you know, despite being in the... Uh, you know, well, second half here now, um, the usual spiel kind of applies, right? Uh, it is a Shohei day, so we got to keep an eye out for shenanigans with his projections. Hopefully, some of the models will stop projecting him as a hitter. Um, so we have to keep an eye out for that. Um, now, here we've got a, <laughs> obviously, a, a huge ownership standard deviation for Luis Castillo, right? Um, that's very clearly... You know, we've got some noise in the numbers coming in here in the early going. Every, everything else is mostly okay so far, but, you know, keep an eye out for projections updates as, as we will push them all throughout the day as usual. Um, Construction-wise, we're probably going to want to include one of the guys here in the upper range here, um, you know, all projecting very well, and they all have some pretty okay matchups, to be quite honest. There's some guys in the mid-range I think we can get to. We'll get you know, go over them as soon as we uh, start going over the games. And maybe a couple of guys down here in the cheap end as well, if you need to get all the way down here or need to get different. Um, we've got some guys at some pretty cheap price tags, Paul Blackburn being one of them, as a matter of fact, that could prove useful tonight in some of our teams, especially if we get to a very expensive arm or an expensive stack elsewhere. So that said, uh, let's just get into the games here, and we'll start with San Francisco and Pittsburgh up top. Um, Ross Stripling, not going to be one of these cheap arms for me that I'm going to mix in. Uh, I've, I got questions about the barrel rate here. Full 12% in 12 appearances this year, seven starts. Um, you know, location has really kind of always plagued Stripling a little bit. He's had, he's shown flashes in his career, right? Uh, but this year he's thrown this change up full 25% of the time. He's given up three and a half outs to the field. Uh, relative to all the other starting pitchers in baseball. So um, that that's super concerning, of course, throwing a two-seamer, a full 7%. It's not a hell of a lot, but giving up a lot of value there, too. Just a break-even four-seamer. So he's got nothing in the fastball and off-speed um, arsenal that can really keep everybody off the table. And sliders just really break even, so not inducing a lot of swing and miss here. Um, a little bit more to the lefties, but we got just a, a short sample. He's getting a little bit of swing and miss with the change up and the curveball. Most of the whiffs are actually coming on the curveball, not the change, though. Um, the big problem here is really that he's not throwing all that hard. He's given up a hell of a lot of hard contact to both sides of the plate. Not super attackable so far, just the 65 hitters that he's seen on from the lefties, but a full 385 Woba and a 328 batting average allow with a 10.5% walk rate. So uh, really concerning here, and it's not m all that much better against the right-handers. The strikeout rate is far depressed compared to the lefties, as a matter of fact, just 16% to the right-handers in the strikeout department with 36% hard contact and th nearly 3-0 homers per nine there as well. What would generally keep stripping in play is the ground ball rate. Um, you know, pretty high to both sides of the plate. You know, buck 40 to the lefties so far is not nothing, right? And a buck 70 to the righties is, is still really strong. Uh, 
but giving up power and floating the baseball a little bit, getting it up in the strike zone, he's got to stay far more down in the strike zone in order for us to get really excited. And, of course, this is a 14-game slate. He's only got a 19% K rate, so we can't get too excited about that, I don't think. I know we do have a 4-0 XFIP with a 6.5 ERA and a low strand rate, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of a tough matchup. The ballpark could put him in play a little bit, I think, at 5,900. But uh, there's some other guys, notably Rich Hill on the other side, that I think we'd probably rather get to uh, in slightly um, you know, higher upside matchups. Pittsburgh should be a little bit healthier. Um, price tag-wise, I'm not sure I want to play offense here necessarily outside of like some Jack Sawinski, Brian Reynolds, of course, you can play. Henry Davis, still cheap in the outfield, still in the you know top third of the lineup, 2,600 or so. Uh, coming out of the break here, that's a, a fine play. And they've brought up some young guys like a Jared Triolo um, and Nick Gonzalez, who they recently called back up as well. So it's okay to mix in a, a piece here or there from Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a tough ballpark, though, and on a 14-game slate, it's usually going to be pretty difficult to get there with them. I'd, I'd search for some... Some big power numbers, like from a Brian Reynolds, Jack Sawinski types, or a cheap Henry Davis if I were going to play any of the Pittsburgh offense uh, against Stripling. So no Stripling for me. 6,000 for Rich Hill. Uh, I think he is in play. Um, now, not all of that thrilling to get to Rich Hill. You know, coming into the break here, um, you know, really kind of regressed back down toward where Rich Hill was very likely to be throughout the rest of the season or through the whole season, right? He performed pretty well. We used him a few times earlier in the year, and he was pretty serviceable um, you know, at a cheap price tag. And I don't think all that much has changed here. This is still an okay matchup. They're going to be able to platoon San Francisco, right? Austin Slater up at the top. Wilmer Flores has third base eligibility once again. He's 3,200. Very strong play there. He's going to pop in value once again. J.D. Davis at 43, still a playable price tag there. And they've got some righties down at the bottom of the lineup, Luis Matos, Casey Schmidt, etc., and Patty Bailey behind the plate. So you could mix in a couple of these right-handers here, but um, overall still a pretty low upside you know, ballpark for San Francisco offense. Um you know, we don't really want it like Pittsburgh suppresses right handed power a pretty good bit and really always has. So um, even though Rich Hill does give it up to the right handers a little bit, right? Full 213 ISO, 347 Woba here, 35 percent hard with some fly balls, 080 ground ball to fly ball, big line drive rate, 27 uh, percent. I think that's more of the figure that would put them in play, not so much the homers that you'd be hunting for. Uh, if you get a guy to hit a ball out, you know, great. Um, their price tax is certainly going to keep them in play, so I'd prefer their offense if I were going to target either one of them. Um, but I'm kind of off of them because I, I do think Rich Hill is in play here a little bit. I don't want to go out of my way to be squeezing in Rich Hill, but I think some of his strikeout upside, you know, he could perform a little bit outsized to his seasonal averages here in this particular matchup because, of course, San Francisco does strike out a good bit still, 25% strikeout rate against the left-handers. With just a 133 ISO. So I, th I think that's going to put Rich Hill in play a little bit if you need to get all the way down there, um, you know, in the, that 6K range. If you don't want to play a, a, a Paul Blackburn or something like that, I think Rich Hill is certainly in play. So I think that's mostly how I'm going to play it. Mostly off of offense, I think. Some Giants if I had to choose, but Rich Hill if I kind of had to choose between... Um, you know, any plays in the game. So uh, mostly just a write-off for me, I think, in, in the starter game here in Pittsburgh. All right, let's move on to Miami and Baltimore. Sandy Alcantara on the mound for the Marlins, getting the O's. Now, he's 6,800, and uh, we're starting to get into territory where there is going to be some upside for Sandy Alcantara. He's not in the 7, 8, 9K range anymore, and I know the underlying, you know, DFS upside metrics, like the raw strikeout rate, Really has not been there. And, of course, the suppression, right? They let him go too deep into the game still. And they throw him out there for the seventh inning and the eighth inning sometimes. And then he just runs out of gas and, and gives up two, three runs. And it torches his outing a lot of the time. If it wasn't torched before that. Um, but at 6,800, that's starting that kind of risk is starting to get a little bit priced in here. We're still looking for positive regression for Sandy. It's just that the changeup has been absolutely horrendous this season. And he's lost about a tick on the velo. That's not t 
terribly worrisome or anything. Um, but he's still throwing a lot of this two-seamer here, not a swing and miss pitch, and missing a lot of the swing and miss off of the slider and the change of combination. So that's the cause for the depressed strikeout rate here. He's given up a little bit of hard, but still getting ground balls. And so I'm mostly still okay with everything that's going on with Sandy. It's just that he hasn't been able to keep guys uh, from scoring, right? He's got a very low strand rate here, 65%. This is a super low number for Sandy, especially for a guy that you know won a Cy Young last year. Um, but the plate discipline numbers I'm not really concerned with overall. It's called strikes that we'd like to see pop up a little bit, um, and that would come with some positive regression back toward his career numbers, right, and with the changeup and the, and the slider. Um, but overall, you know, this is a difficult matchup, and I don't really want to go out of my way to be targeting Baltimore. There's still a very good offense against right-handed pitching. But at 6,800, I think you might want to start considering putting some Sandy into your teams. At 75 and, and north of that, I think he was just a total non-starter given the bad changeup value this year. Baltimore's going to platoon quite heavily, right, with uh, a lot of their lefties. They'll have five, six in the top seven uh, hitters here tonight. So it's going to still make it a little bit difficult for Sandy to run really deep into a game. Even though he's a horse, he goes out and throws, you know, 95-plus every single start. Um, still a difficult spot, but we're, like I mentioned, we're getting into the territory price-wise with Sandy where all of the seasonal numbers starting to get priced in, and the upside is starting to get a little bit more attractive for him to pop for a 25-point outing here or there. So I think that's in the tank for him. I'm not going to go out of my way to play him unless it's in like correlated teams with the Marlins here, which I do really like. I love going after Dean Kramer. He's on the mound for them at 70, uh, for the Orioles, that is, at 7,100. I don't want anything to do with this. Um, I don't think Dean's all that great. Now, he'll pop every once in a while for, you know, kind of like a survival outing. Um, but I don't like anything about this arsenal here. I don't like that he throws a two-seamer, even though he's getting good value on it. It's not a swing and miss pitch, so it really leaves it on the table for me in terms of DFS upside. And I don't think this is all that great a matchup. Right, he's got a bad four seamer or a break even four seamer, I should say. He's got a bad cutter, giving up two outs to the field there. Bad changeup, same thing, and doesn't have any value on either breaking pitch. That is really just a, you know, kind of a, a show me sort of arsenal here in the breaking category. So, um, no real secondaries to speak of. And he's got a bad cutter and a break even four seamer with just 15% usage on the two seamer here. There's re really not a lot of upside, even though he does have a little bit of swing and miss to the right-handers. I mean, he's given up a lot of production to the lefties here. A full 307 batting average and a 386 Woba with a 233 ISO to the left side. 20% K rate, 070 ground ball to fly ball, and 38% hard contact with two and a half homers per nine. That's uh, pretty concerning here for Dean Kramer, and I want to go after that with some... Certainly some lefties over here, but I have no problem playing a Georgie Soler or Brian De La Cruz from the right side either. And Garrett Cooper showing a little bit of pop this year too, so uh, a little bit more than his career averages at least. So I think some sneaky Marlin stacks are actually pretty in play here and maybe a correlated team or two with some Sandy Alcantara. He's a very cheap price tag for Sandy. And I think even in a difficult matchup, uh, you might be able to squeeze a little bit of upside out of the Marlins here tonight. Um you know, they're basically pick them in the betting markets right now. I don't think this is horrible. Probably like a bit better than a dollar, dollar five that you're getting on them right now. Um, if you could get like a buck 15 on them, I think that's a pretty okay punt into betting markets. I really don't respect Dean Kramer at all. Um, and I think the Marlins offense is actually pretty dangerous. Of course, with Lurie's Arise up at the top, you can mix him in in stacks too. I probably prefer to play full Marlin stacks if and when I get there. Um, because nobody's going to have it, and it's more comfortable playing Luis Arise on a 14-game slate in a full stack rather than in a short stack or a one-off. And full stacks, I'm, you know, short stacks, I'd prefer not to be using um, you know, guys in the downside of their own platoons like a Georgie Soler or Brian De La Cruz. So overall, I, I do think the Marlins can be in play here. Not a favorite stack by any means, but I want to go after Dean Kramer. I think they're very interesting in tournaments, and I think Sandy Alcantara could prove a little bit serviceable at this particular price tag too certainly a very low ownership so um kind of on the marlins there a little bit
All right, let's move on. Arizona and Toronto. Uh, Ryan Nelson on the mound, 6,300. Now, Ryan Nelson's not bad, right? He doesn't have a lot of upside, of course. He's not a DFS pitcher. He's going to pitch to a good bit of contact, 83% on the season he's not gonna throw past anybody just the 16 percent k rate but he's pretty efficient early in the count he's got fine chase for somebody that doesn't have a all that much swing and miss in the tank and it's the eight and a half percent swinging strike rate that's really keeping this csw really depressed here at just 23 percent so that's where we get kind of concerned with ryan nelson it's just the raw contact rate that he's gonna pitch to it's not that it's terribly uh poor contact i mean there's some loud hard contact let's not get it confused 36 percent in aggregate here that's not uh all that attractive necessarily but he's not bad right his arsenal at least compared to a guy like dean kramer for example uh he's break even pretty much everywhere break even four seamer break even change break even slider and you know yeah he's giving it up on the, on the curveball that's mostly just to show me curveball uh so his the three pitches that he's maining here four seamer slider change are mostly pretty okay, even though he doesn't have a lot of swing and miss. So he's not bad. However, this is, of course, a terrible matchup. Toronto's definitely going to be one of the top stacks of the day because they're excellent against right-handed pitching, and Ryan Nelson's not going to throw it past him. But usually I don't like going after him because he's kind of hard to stack against sometimes, uh, even though you know there's going to be generally a lot of contact. I, I do respect the arsenal a little bit for him there, but uh, a very dangerous team to be going after with right-handers here certainly in Toronto buck 10 WRC plus with a 21% K rate they hit for some average right a full 260 nearly as a team here not so much in the power department so that's really how they disappoint a lot of the time at their relative price tags because they're all pretty expensive generally right 55 for Springer it's kind of a, an elevated number for him this season at least Bo Bichette's been great he's at 54 you can play him certainly and then you've got Vladdy at 52, Matt Chapman 48, et cetera, et cetera. All the other guys are pretty cheap, right? Brandon Belt, uh, Dalton Varsho, and Witt, um, and on down the line. You can get to them, no problem. But even still, not a whole lot of power upside that the Jays have shown, even though they do create some runs here. So really dangerous to be – I mean, you can't play Ryan Nelson. There's no upside for him on a 14-gamer. Um but really dangerous to be going after Toronto with right-handers, as it really has, has been the case for the last couple of seasons. Uh, if I were going to be stacking Toronto, I think that's pretty warranted, right? Um, I would like to mix in some Brandon Belt, of course. Unfortunately, he lost his outfield eligibility again. So you've got to choose between him and Vlad, of course. Per that Vladdy is probably going to be pretty popular, having won the Derby, right? Uh, 5200 that's a pretty good price. He was kind of heating up coming into the break. And power numbers might be starting to show up for Vladdy a little bit here coming into the second half. So he'll be a little popular if you want to get a little different with your Toronto stacks. You can play belt. That's no problem. And we do have the uh, the Guriel and Varsho sort of head-to-head -head matchup, right? Uh, this was one of the bigger trades of the offseason. These guys in, uh, in a one-to-one -one swap here. Um, Guriel's been far, far better. Uh, at the particular DFS price tag, probably not all that attractive. 4900 here tonight against Chris Bassett, who I, ha as we mentioned, do have here in the sheet. Um, Dalton Varsho on, you know, for the Jays, he's at 3300 even though he's been absolutely terrible this season. He's certainly playable because Ryan Nelson's not going to throw past him, right? So um, we are going to like Toronto and no Ryan Nelson here for me, but Chris Bassett on the other side, I don't want anything to do with him either. He's seen 10% ownership, and I think this is uh, about 10% too high. Um, he's got horrific numbers against left-handers this season. Full 290 average, that's not the worst in baseball, but it's pretty damn close. 403 Wobo is pretty egregiously bad, and a 290 ISO, this is awful. He's given up 2.6 homers per nine to the left-handers. It's because he's throwing mostly a two-seamer. He's got a bad cutter here, and the changeup just break even. Um, relative to the the rest of the fastball mix, I mean, he's given up a lot of value here. Full 10% of the four-seamer. He's given up five outs to the field there. Just no confidence in that four-seamer at all. His best pitch is and always has been really the two-seamer, but that's not a strikeout pitch, and now that he's throwing it more mostly to uh, the left-handers, 
I mean, he's getting really picked apart here. Big line drive rate, I mean, big-ish, 21% here, 34% hard contact, but a lot of fly balls, 075 ground ball to fly ball ratio to the lefties. He's got a 10% barrel rate. I don't want to deal with this uh, against Arizona over here. They don't strike out, just a 20% strikeout rate against right-handers this year. Buck 05 WRC Plus it's ticked up quite a few um, in the last, what, you know, month or so. And do I want to stack Arizona here? I mean, you could if um, if you're comfortable eating 6,000 on Cattell Marte, 61 on Corbin Carroll. That's fine, whatever. But 57 for Christian Walker is kind of insane and definitely in a bad matchup against Chris Bassett, who is still pretty damn good against right-handers, right? 193 batting average allowed, 242 Woba, and an 090 ISO. Even though the strikeout rate is depressed there at sub-21%, he's far, far better in suppression against right-handers with a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. It's just that the split to the left-handers is so drastic here that kind of has to put stacks in play. Like I mentioned, I don't want to play Lourdes Gurriel at 4,900 necessarily or any of the other right-handers at all. The other lefties, like a Jake McCarthy, Alec Thomas types, they're cheap and they make stacks happen, but they're not all that great of hitters. Um, it's an upside spot for them up against Chris Bassett, though, from the left side of the plate, however. Jerry Perdomo at the top of the lineup. I think he's a fine dual eligible second base and shortstop kind of middle infield play tonight if you want to get there. Um, and he does make it a little bit cheaper if you want to click in some Cattell Marte and Corbin Carroll. So probably just a three-man uh, lefty stack is how I'd like to approach it. Get to the top three lefties here from Arizona. Because as soon as you start getting into the righties, that's when Chris Bassett can really do a lot of damage in suppressing production against your offense. So... Um, that's how I'd kind of like to play it. No pitching here for me pretty much at all. And, you know, some full Toronto stacks, short stacks, I think they're all in play. And a little bit of Arizona, too. Certainly one-offs of, like, Corbin Carroll types. Uh, but some short stacks are, are a little bit intriguing for me also. Okay, let's move on to the Dodgers and the Mets here. Um, interesting pitching matchup here tonight. Really looking for some regression for both of these guys to the upside. Uh, Julio Urias has been dreadful this season. 8,800, I think, is a very playable price tag. This is a 10K arm. Um, he has not displayed that this season because he's had real difficulty with the changeup. Historically, he's always been a kind of a reverse splitsy type of guy. He's given up more production to the left-handers. It's because his four-seamer is pretty straight to the lefties. He gives up a lot of production there to the left side of the plate, a lot of power. And that's really persisting a little bit this season, giving up a, I mean, you can see it here with a 269 ISO and 2.6 homers per nine. Now, he's only got 13 and two thirds. He was hurt, right? Was out for whatever, a month and, and change with the hammy. Um, but before that, he was not very good. And I think he did have, what, one start after he came back where he was excellent, went uh, what, six innings, maybe seven innings or something. I'm pulling it up here on the other side. They're on the other monitor. So when six innings struck out eight against Pittsburgh, right, in his last start. He got picked apart, um, you know, two starts ago after, in his first start, I guess, after he came back against Kansas City, went three innings, struck out just two and gave up five earned. So that's not great. Um, but hopefully the break has given him a little bit of time to get things right here. He's not this bad, and I think some of the downside has been priced in a little bit. So... Even though this is a difficult strikeout matchup, I think we can go after a little bit of the Mets. This is just a poor offense, man. And we've been able to attack them on occasion. I mean, there's no way that this team should be six games under 500. Um, it's because of their offense. I mean, they're pitching, including Verlander, right? They have not been all that excellent, right? Um, and they've had some guys like Scherzer has been down a couple of times. He's really been the one bright spot. Uh, Karai Senga has not been excellent, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they've been struggling on the mound a little bit, but it's mostly their offense that has really underperformed, even against left-handers this season where they've got a little bit of an advantage, right? Tommy Pham, Pete Alonzo, Frankie hits from the right side, Frankie Alvarez, of course, behind the plate, Starling Marte. They've got some guys over here that don't strike out a lot and they have a lot of upside from the right side, but they really haven't shown a lot of uh, consistency in that respect this season. So really hard to get thrilled about stacking the Mets against uh, left-handers. And really the same goes for them against uh, right-handers as well. Just pretty underwhelming offense. So I think you could consider playing a bounce here at very low ownership with Luis. Uh, Luis. Uh, I've done this about 10 times this year. Uh, Julio Urias. 
at 88, at, excuse me, 8,800. Uh, I think the plate discipline numbers are still pretty damn good. He's not walking anybody still. Barrel rate slightly concerning, of course, with so many fly balls to the left-handers. And he does give up some fly balls to the righties as well. So we've got to get him off of the barrel, but I do really still like the uh, soft contact numbers here at north of 20% to both sides. I think these power numbers are, are quite outsized. right? He does just have a 199 X ISO, and the numbers realized uh, against are quite a bit higher than that. You know, So running a, a couple ticks cold there, same thing with the WOBA, and same thing with the expected batting average here. So uh, I think you could play a little bit of regression bounce for Urias here. Um, in the range, of course, you know, we'll get to some guys later. 8,800, he's certainly not my favorite, but... Um, I think he's in play in tournaments of very low ownership. He's, he absolutely has 25 and 30 in the tank here because he could very well get a good bit of run support and another five points, or excuse me, four points uh, for getting a win here. And that's because they get Verlander, the Dodgers, on the other side, who's not throwing past anybody. He's having real problems throwing strike one, 53% this, ye this season. He's got a full 12 starts now. So uh, we've got to basically kind of capitulate and say okay Verlander you know maybe the strikeout the early strikeout um or strike one problems I should say and the strikeout rate it maybe these problems are just going to persist for the rest of the year um he's been a little bit more stabilized I should say uh recently um you know, but that doesn't mean he hasn't been totally attackable still, right? He's just not throwing it past anybody, even though he's going deeper into games and throwing a lot of pitches per start. It, there's just no DFS upside for him. So and cer certainly not in this matchup against the Dodgers. Uh, I would like to get to a little bit of L.A. here if I can make it happen. It's just price tags. Max Muncy, I think, is very much in play at 4600 That's a fine price tag for him. I really balk when he's above 5000 you can always play Mookie. You can always play Freddie. The ballpark's going to make this difficult, of course. This is at City Field, and we might have some weather to deal with here tonight. So keep an eye out for that. we got weather all over the place. So, um, Not my favorite stack, necessarily, because I do still respect Verlander, of course. Uh, but this is a very difficult matchup. I don't want really anything to do with him, and certainly not a 15% ownership against the Dodgers. That, that's just like a total non-starter for me. I think there's plenty of other guys in the 8K range I'd much rather play. There's two guys, $300 cheaper, uh, that are going to see roughly the same ownership here that we'll get to here in a little bit. So no thank you on the Verlander. Do I want to play some of the Mets? I mean, not really. It, you can always play Petey. You can always play Frankie Lindor. They're fine. Um, you can mix in a Tommy Pham. He's cheap. He's hit lefties fine this year. And Julio Urias has given up a little bit more pop to right-handers this season, of course, with a 1.8 homers per nine, 213 ISO. But once again, still looking for a little bit of positive regression for him. You want to play a Frankie Alvarez behind the plate? Well, now you're just, like, stacking against a guy who's a good arm and who has historically suppressed production against right-handers pretty damn well. It's just that this season, this changeup has not been good at all. So... Um, now you're playing a right-handed stack against a guy that gives up more production to lefties. So I'm not super thrilled about it. You want to mix in Brandon Nimmo or uh, Jeff McNeil, Brett Beatty from the left side? I mean, not really, right? So it would just be probably one-offs, Pete Alonzo, Frankie Alvarez, Frankie Lindor, or a mix-in kind of one-off Tommy Pham cheap outfield piece or something. And from the Dodgers, same sort of deal, where they're well-priced and where they're good hitters, Freddie, Mookie, um, you know, that sort of thing. J.D. is fine, I guess. Verlander's been giving up a little bit more hard contact and production to the righties this year. So Mookie and, and J.D. Martinez are fine there. Will Smith, still expensive at 5,500, so not my favorite there. So kind of off of offense, even though I think both of these guys have really shown this season that they're very attackable. Um, I still do respect them a little bit, even though I don't really want to play Verlander. Uh, I do kind of want to play Urias a little bit. All right, let's move on. Milwaukee and Cincinnati. Uh, I'm probably going to leave pitching off the table here. Definitely no Graham Ashcraft for me, even at a very attractive 5,100. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Corbin Burns for the Brewers here at 8,400. Now, I, I really like playing Corbin Burns against lefty-heavy lineups. It's because he's got an elite cutter changeup combination. And it's these two pitches that really suppress a lot of production to left-handers. 193 batting average allowed with a 262 WOBA and a 106 ISO. He's got an above average strikeout rate, two ticks above average, as a matter of fact, 25% to 
to the left-handers. Gets a hell of a lot of ground balls at a buck 80 per. Soft contact rate higher than the hard contact rate. Really like playing Corbin Burns against lefty heavy lineups. Um, however, this is going to be the third time that Cincinnati has seen him, and he did just see them right before the break um, about, what, 10 days ago or so. Or seven days ago, I, I suppose. Um, so we gotta have, we're going to have to side with Cincinnati and the offense in that respect, but I don't really want to play them at these price tags. Still, they're still very expensive. 55 for McLean from the right side. Johnny India at 49. Yeah, kind of gross there. 63 for Ellie. Got his dual eligibility back, but uh, yikes, man. Um, Jake Fraley still 47. Joey Votto is playable price tag at 4,400, and I've got no problem playing him necessarily against, you know, in particular against Corbin Burns. Um, but do I want to go out of my way to play him at first base in a 14 gamer? I mean, probably not. Spencer Steer is still above 5,000, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you have to side with Corbin Burns a little bit. Um, you know, at the price tag and certainly at the ownership. But since it's the third time he's seen them and twice in the last week, uh, you got to side with the offense. So kind of a write-off here in that respect, mostly because of the Cincinnati price tags. And I don't like stacking against Corbin Burns with teams that are going to platoon very heavily, and Cincinnati's certainly going to do that. Uh, if I did get to some pieces here, it would be some of the right-handers, like a Matt McLean um, or a Spencer Steer, but they're out of control expensive for this particular matchup. He's still okay against righties, even though he gives up more fly balls, more hard contact, and more iso. Um, he's still not a total trash can here that doesn't walk people and stays off of the barrel. So um, overall, I do think Corbin Burns at 8,400 and 2.5% ownership is very much in play. And I think that's a fine tournament play, but uh, still a pretty dangerous spot attacking Cincinnati or trying to attack Cincinnati because they're a very strong offense production. They're going to continue to tick up. We saw in the last two games of the series, um, you know, right before the break in Milwaukee here between these two teams, there was a lot of offense and uh, well, Corbin Burns was not really, you know, on the hook for a lot of that, but you know, Cincinnati's offense really definitely responsible. So, um, you know, dangerous and concerning to go after these guys, even though the, there's high expected run totals in this game. I'm not super thrilled about it. Outside, uh, I'd much rather play Milwaukee, right? I want to go after Graham Ashcraft here a little bit, and it's because of the arsenal. Like, he's got the slider. That's, you know, sure, whatever. But he throws 50% of a cutter here, and similar to Corbin Burns, he is a reverse split guy, and he gives up more production and more power to the right side, and that's because of the cutter. When you've only got the cutter, now he is throwing the two-seamer a little bit more, right? Similar fastball mixes for these two guys. But with the cutter, it tails right over the barrel to a, a same-handed hitter, and that's what translates into a 298 batting average, 375 Woba, and a 187 ISO to the right-handers. He pitches to way too much contact here, 39%. Even though he gets a lot of ground balls, 39% hard contact is very concerning. As you can see, it's just a 21% hard contact rate to the lefties and a higher ground ball rate. And that's the cutter really going to work there. He needs a change up. That's why Corbin Burns would be far more, or I'd be far more attracted to Corbin Burns' arsenal, right? Because he's got the change and he's got more swing and miss in him. Um, so even at 5,100, despite the very attractive price tag here against a pretty poor offense in general i'd much rather get to the brewers here and i think they're a pretty attractive stack um they're popping really hard in value today and they're going to pop pretty hard in ownership commensurately as well so i don't have any problem going after ashcraft um he's throwing the two seamer which is really not the choice of a fastball i'd prefer he add if you were going to get off of some of the cutter usage it'd, it'd have to be a four seamer because two seamer is also not a swing and a miss pitch and that's also going to leave him susceptible to left-handers now so he's kind of giving back a lot of the value or some of the value that he gains on the cutter against left-handers right back with the sinker so that's concerning here and i'm not really thrilled about despite you know good velo uh with graham ashcraft so uh, i'm going to stay off of him and try and get to some Brewers here where I can. I don't want to play Jesse Winker. It's mostly going to be right-handers, I think, like a Willie Contreras, Willie Adamas. I, I like Yelich, of course, and, and Owen Miller, certainly. He's back down to 3,400. I like that a good bit. Brian Anderson is very playable here, too. So is Bryce Terang, who is still up, and Joey Weimer down at the bottom as well. So 
no problem really playing anybody but Jesse Winker because he's probably going to get pinch hit for it because he sucks. Um, so offense really only here for me for the most part. Uh, Corbin Burns in some correlated Brewer stacks. You can get contrary in there with some Corbin Burns teams or some Brewers teams, I should say, with Corbin Burns in them. So I think that's a fine construction, decent way to play it. Okay, let's move on. White Sox and the Braves. Zero Michael Kopech for me in this 8K range today. Uh, 13% bear, or walk rate and a 14% barrel rate. 56% strike one. I just can't do it. I know he's got some upside whiffs at 30% against left-handers, but the Braves are stupidly right-handed heavy. And the, the couple lefties they've got in the lineup, Matt Olson and Eddie Rosario, Michael Harris, are not bad hitters by any means. So... I don't want anything to do with Michael Kopech here um, at 0.3% ownership that we're showing in aggregate for him right now. I think this is uh, about 0.3% too high. So I want nothing to do with him. Um, it's it's the walk rate and it's the barrel rate. He's giving it up to both sides here. It, there's way too many fly balls. There's way too much hard contact to right-handers. Um, he's a little bit of a reverse split as well. And I don't want to deal with that. Like, I like Acuna still at 6,600. You could play that. Ozzy Albies from the left side. I'm not super jacked about in this particular matchup um, at 5,600. But you could play him in stacks. I like Austin Riley here a little bit, 4,900. And Sean Murphy at 54 is okay. Their price tags have come down compared to where they were, you know, a week, two weeks before the break. Um, most notably for the guys down at the bottom third of the lineup, Ozuna, Eddie... Orlando Arcia and Michael Harris, they're all back under 4,000 now, so it makes Brave Stacks far more palatable and easier to get to. So um, I've got no problem getting to Braves against Kopech tonight. I want nothing to do with him. And Charlie Morton, I'm a little lukewarm on this. Now, he's popping really hard in the projection and value scores here in the early going. 9,000, I think the price tag is fine. This is an okay matchup right against Chicago. They don't have a lot of power. Uh, Charlie Morton's problem is still left-handers, and they're going to be very right-handed heavy over here. They got Ben Intendi, but it's like Ben Intendi, okay. And then they've got Yasmani Grandal and Oscar Colas, uh, and because they're still missing you on Moncada. Um, Gavin Sheets may be in there, but who knows what they're going to be doing with him? They've left him out recently in right-handed match platoon matchups for him uh, coming into the break. So who knows what you know. Griffol's going to do over here in Chicago, but this is a hitter's ballpark down here, so I'm kind of lukewarm on Charlie Morton, to be honest. He's still, I'm not pre not impressed with the arsenal uh, outside of the curveball, and I've been expecting the curveball to be bad and regress, even though it's still a very good pitch. Um, you know, if he doesn't have this on any one day, we saw it against, I believe it was Colorado, a couple of starts for Charlie before the break, where he gave up like five in the first couple innings. Um... So I'm not super thrilled about going after Charlie with very high ownership here, even though this is a pretty good matchup. Um, I think playing some Char some Morton here and some correlated Braves teams is reasonable, but it's a $9,000 price tag. There's probably some other guys I think I'd prefer to play in tournaments, um, and it's mostly because the strikeout rate for Charlie against right-handers is depressed compared to where it is against lefties. So... At very high ownership, I, I might come in under on this. Uh, I'm not sure. I obviously haven't built teams yet, but it's kind of where I'm leaning here in the early going. I like Charlie. I think it's fine. Um, and I like going after the White Sox a little bit because they're still striking out at a 23% clip, 85 WRC plus with buck 50 ISO and average metrics everywhere and well below average for a hitting team or for an offense, I should say, uh, in the ground ball to fly ball ratio. So, um, Charlie's going to induce some ground balls here, and he's got some whips in him against a low upside offense. So I think it's fine playing him. I, I think I'd probably just come in underweight at this particular ownership figure. So no problem playing any of the Braves here. Um, you got to lay you know, $2.50 on him here in the betting market, so that's not, uh, not easy. But uh, their DFS prices are far more palatable to get to in stacks here. Probably just going to stay off of most of the White Sox outside of like a Luis Robert. He's 6,000, though. I'm not super jacked about that. Um, and everybody else is mostly a ground ball hitter. So if you get, like, a Gavin Sheets in there, I think that's an okay play. But uh, outside of that, mostly off of the White Sox for me. 
Okay, let's move on. Cleveland and Texas. Uh, Aaron Savali on the mound for the Guardians. Uh, I'm not going to play him, even though I generally don't like stacking a hell of a lot against Savali. He's a good arm. You know, he, he's not a good DFS arm necessarily because there's not a lot of upside. 21% K rate this season. He's so efficient early in the count. 71% strike one. And pushing 29-30% chase rate here. He doesn't have a lot of swing and miss, but he's still got a 30% CSW, and that's a damn good number. It's because he's got five and, and six pitches here that he goes to work with. Good cutter that keeps the left-handers off the board. And he's got a, a, an okay equitable balance here between the four-seamer and the two-seamer. I wish he... I wish guys would just stop throwing this two-seamer all together unless they can really bury it. Savali can't really do that necessarily. Um, and it's just, you know, for DFS purposes, it's not a, a swing and miss pitch. But overall, Savali's arsenal here is pretty equitable. He's got a, a fine show-me slider, good swing and miss on the curveball, good equity here, and a good cutter. So that keeps him, you know, really serviceable against pretty balanced lineups, um, especially when he's mixing in you know, three different fastballs here, and a slider. I would like to see him throw more of a changeup, but obviously not a lot of confidence in this pitch. He doesn't throw it a lot. So um, no matter, he's at 7,300 overpriced for this particular matchup, and I just don't play very low upside, high contact pitchers against Texas uh, for obvious reasons. So now do I want to stack Texas on the other side? I mean, sure, you can consider that. They, they average like six and a half runs a game at home. You can stack one of the best offenses in baseball pretty much every night, but they're expensive still, right? 62 for Semyon, 65 for Corey Seager. That would take me off in this particular matchup due to this cutter here at that price tag. Nate Lowe, a little bit expensive here for him at 4,600. Same thing with Jonah Heim at 49. Um, Josh Young still over 5,000. Addy Garcia is 5,900. So not easy to get to these guys. Um, they're really collectively like as expensive or even more expensive than Atlanta. So I prefer Atlanta today, but you can go after Savali because he does still pitch to a lot of contact. John Gray, no thanks for me against Cleveland. I don't really trust him, uh, even though he's got good value on the changeup and the slider combination this season. Like, where's all the swing and miss? I mean, just not inducing any swing and miss to either side of the plate. It's 20% to both sides here. He's not really getting picked apart in value, certainly not in batting average or anything, but I think he may have been running a little bit hot, certainly in that six or seven stretch, uh, seven game stretch that he went through. After he came back, you know, took a, a start off, had the blister, he came back, he got bludgeoned, um, you know, got beat up pretty terribly by Toronto. And... I mean, I don't really want to deal with this. I, I don't trust him, um, and I think he's running a little bit hot. His last four starts since that, um, you know, really good stretch ended, right? He had Toronto, he had the Yankees, he had Houston, then he had Boston, where he's not striking out anybody, and he, he's given up six earned, one earned against the Yankees, so that was fine, but gave up five earned against Houston and three earned against Boston. And with no strikeouts here for John Gray, if he gives up any production, it's just impossible for him to make that up. And at 8,300, I'd rather play some other guys in the price range. So I'm going to leave him off the table as well against Cleveland because they're very unlikely to strike out. He could suppress here because he's still a good enough arm to run six or seven innings and strike out four or five um, and not give up a run or maybe you know give up one, give up two. But even if he gives up two, he's going to have to go seven innings to really put up a serviceable score and earn a win out of it. So not really interested at this particular price tag, which you were a little bit cheaper. I think we need to see continued price depression for John Gray to get him back down under 7,000 or under 8,000 before we start getting excited about playing him uh, in below average matchups again. So it's kind of where I stand on this game. Um, no Cleveland for me. I just don't like playing them on full slates like this, but you can play Josie literally every single night. You can play Josh Naylor. That's okay. And Andres Jimenez was heating up a little bit before the break. Steven Kwan's still fine. Good contact piece for him um, at 4,100. You could see some runs scored here because Cleveland's going to make a lot of contact. And John Gray is super variant, or super high variance, I should say. Uh, when he's bad, he is really, really bad. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Cleveland got to John Gray here a little bit. Um, but 
pretty low probability still for me to get excited about that on a full 14 game slate. So offense only here for me, but very little because of the price tags on Texas and due to how bad Cleveland is. All right, let's move on. Boston and Chicago. Um, Brian Bayo on the mound here for the Red Sox. I think he's in play in tournaments. Uh, he was one of the, or is one of the 7,700 arms I was alluding to earlier. We'll get to the, the other one here later. Um, in tournaments, I think he's got to be in play. He's got really damn good numbers against the right side of the plate. Even though he's given up some you know, 38% hard contact here, he's got a very low line drive rate there. It's just 50, 15% and a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball ratio against righties with a 26% strikeout rate. So a lot of the Cubs' better hitters are hitting from the right side, at least they're power hitters, right? Um, and Nico, of course, he's a pest. He's hitting from the right side too. Say a Suzuki, Chris Morrell, and both catchers, or one of the nine catchers they have on the roster. Um, leave it up to a former catcher manager to carry three catchers. In any case, um, they do still have Mike Talkman, Ian Happ, Cody Bellinger from the left side, right? Jared Young. You know, from the left side as well. So they could be kind of balanced here, which is why I'm not super excited about playing Brian Bayo. It's because of the depressed strikeout rate to the left-handers, 15% there compared to the 26% to the righties. It's not like he's given up a lot of power. Still buck 65 ground ball to fly ball there and a very low line drive rate also. Depressed hard contact rate, 30% to the lefties. So he, the suppression is still there for him, which is why I think he's in play in tournaments. But I would be a little bit concerned with some upside because they can still throw four and five lefties in the lineup here. So um, Chicago might be able to break up the potential for a, a lot of upside for Bayo here tonight. So um, if you need, if you get like really chalky and you're playing like the Yankees and you land on a 7,700 arm, but don't also want to play uh, like Kenta Maeda at the same price tag, I think Brian Bayo is a fine tournament pivot if you need to get there. This is not necessarily like a single entry play or anything, uh, but I think I do think he is in play in deeper tournament stuff. Um, the Arsenal's pretty good. He sacrificed a lot of the swing and miss this season compared to earlier in his career, but he's given up all of the, or he's gotten rid of all of the power, I should say, and most of the fly balls. So very attractive here. Walks are very much under control for him. And I think Brian Bale's really turned the corner. He's going to be a serviceable starter for for Boston going forward. Kyle Hendricks on the mound. Like, I'm kind of off of Boston, even though they're popping really hard in value. It's mostly because, in, at least in my opinion, because they're cheap. This is a, a good offense, of course, against right-handed pitching, right? 21% K rate, 104 WRC+, plus, buck 70 ISO, give or take. 330 WOBA, give or take. 265 average. That's, you know, all pretty damn good numbers. Where I'm worried here is that Kyle Hendricks' changeup here is one of the best pitches in baseball still. Uh, even though he's only throwing you know, 56 miles an hour, similar to Zach Granke, the changeup is still an elite, elite pitch. He's still very efficient early in the count, and he's very balanced in the four-seamer, two-seamer change. I wish he didn't throw nearly as much of the two-seamer, uh, and I wish he'd balance it out a little more, maybe even an, introduce a cutter, but at this point in his career, he doesn't really need to because the changeup is so good. And that's really going to keep a lot of these left-handers off the board a little bit. Jaron Duran, Yoshida's going to make some contact. He's at a fine, playable $4,600 price tag if you want to go there. But I don't want to go out of my way to be playing a Rafi Devers at 54 necessarily or Tristan Casas, Alex Verdugo from the left side of the plate because of this changeup. I really, really respect this pitch. I don't think we could play Kyle Hendricks on a 14-game slate because it didn't, he doesn't have any strikeout upside. But he has suppression upside, and that mostly takes me off of Boston instead of putting me on to Kyle Hendricks. So that's how I want to attack this game, I think. Uh, it's mostly just a write-off, maybe some Brian Bayo. Um, sure, you can have a Yoshida at 4600 I think it's a fine price tag, or, and you can always play Devers, of course. But I don't really want to play any of the right-handers here. Hendricks is inducing 25% soft contact versus 27% uh excuse me, 25% soft contact versus 27% hard contact to the right side. And it's not all that much better to the lefties because he gives up an 075 ISO to the left-hander. So, um, you know, really difficult to go after Kyle Hendricks here in the nine-start sample that we've got on in this season. He's gotten picked apart, and he's going to do that occasionally because he pitches to a lot of contact. But um, I may come off of Boston here because I really respect this pitch. So I think that's kind of how I want to play it. A little bit of Brian Bayo, offensive pieces here or there where they're well-priced, but mostly just singletons, I think. 
Okay, Tampa and Kansas City. Uh, Tyler Glasnow on the mound. Yeah, let's do it. 10-3 gets Kansas City, and he's got you know some of the best case stuff in baseball here. Um, we're still concerned that Glasnow is going to be able to run deep into a game. Right, he is coming off the oblique and coming off TJ and all this kind of jazz. Um, but encouraging that he's going north of five innings at least uh, it, at a full five and a third here so far. He's still only throwing 90 pitches. We need to see this elevate when we start considering paying outsized exposures for him at these price tags, you know, north of 10,000. But this is a killer matchup, and the Royals are bad. So I've got no problem getting to him today. Um, as we mentioned, like. It's, it's probably going to be pretty difficult to construct a lot of teams that don't include somebody in the upper 9K range today because the projection deltas between them and everybody else are just so high. Huge value score here for a guy priced this aggressively at 10-3. 38 in the value score is very high. So I got no problems playing Glasnow here. Um, he is leaning a little bit to some fly balls with some hard contact from the right side. So that could put a Bobby Witt or a Salvi Perez in play, of course. Salvi's at 4400 That's a playable price tag for sure. Um, but I don't want to go out of my way to be targeting Tyre Glass now. I think there's, you know, this is a 14-game slate. You can play plenty of other spots that going after one of the highest upside guys on the day. 36% aggregate K rate here so far. I think he's going to probably, I mean, he's pretty likely to tear apart the Royals here. So this is unfortunately one of the, Pretty big questionable weather spots that we've got tonight. So get to keep an eye out for that. And that's what's going to keep the ownership, or at least my exposures, down on Glass now. 25% ownership so far. I have no problem with this. Um, do you want to come in over? Yeah, maybe 5-10% over or something like that if you really like it. Or even 5-10% under I think is perfectly fine just because you've got so many other arms you could play. But uh, a healthy dose of Tyler Glass now tonight I think is perfectly warranted. But we got to be careful of this super suspicious barrel rate. 18% here in eight starts. That is a woefully concerning number. So keep that in mind. At very high ownership, we got weather. Uh, he's expensive, and he's got a he's been doing a lot of barrel contact here. So you got to be careful. Um, 317 ISO in the shortish sample here to the left-handers with 53% hard contact is not nothing. So Nick Prado and maybe an MJ Melendez at cheap price tags, Kyle Isbell at 22, Michael Massey 25, et cetera, et cetera. They, they are in play. If Glasnow steams north of 30% or something in ownership, I think you could play some leverage stacks on the other side, even though I do really like him. No Alec Marsh for me. He's had two starts in the bigs this year. One of them was against Dodgers where he got blasted. He was serviceable in his previous start. Um, let's see. Uh, I forget who it was against, as a matter of fact. Uh, pulling him up on the other monitor here, so I'm kind of stalling. Uh, it was Minnesota, right? And Minnesota is bad, and he survived for a full five innings, struck out five. The problem here is that he's walked. he walked four Dodgers in that four-inning start where he gave up five runs, and then he walked three Twins in that last start when he went five innings. So um, I got walk rate concerns here, and I'm not playing... Anybody with um, with those kinds of susceptibilities against Tampa. Now, they're expensive. It's going to be hard. I would rather, um, I would rather like, pivot to the Braves, you know, for example, if I'm going to be paying these price tags. But I do like Tampa here. And unfortunately, we are just going to have to keep an eye out for some weather. I think this may be one of the games that uh, could get washed out here tonight. So, um, Tampa almost exclusively for me here in most scenarios, but... Uh, if you want to take some leverage stacks, if his ownership steams against Glass now, I think that's perfectly well in play. Okay, let's move on. Washington and Cardinals. Um, now, as I mentioned at the outset, I've got Mackenzie Gore in here. Who knows if it's Trevor Williams? Uh, a couple of spots do have him. And if it is Trevor Williams, he's a total non-starter against the Cardinals, so no thank you. Their run total actually did pop about half a run here in the last half hour in the early morning, uh, up through the five. So that's a pretty significant move there um, and would suggest that, that it's probably going to be Trevor Williams. In any case, I've got Mackenzie Gore in here. Um, you know, if it is Trevor Williams, he's bad against lefties, he's bad against righties. You can kind of go after him with everybody. Um, he's a little bit better against right-handers, but you can still, you know, mix in Goldschmidt, Arenado, Wilson Contreras. You, you know, you don't have any problems doing that. Uh, Mackenzie Gore, he's got a little bit of a reverse split problem here as well in terms of, you know, base runners and hard contact. 
Uh, 36% hard contact to the lefties, 167 ISO, but he gives up pop to the right-handers too, 178 ISO there with far more fly balls, 37% hard contact there as well. So he's attackable a little bit, even though he does have very good strikeout stuff. This is not necessarily the strikeout matchup that I want to be targeting um, with a guy that's given up some power, and he's got a 10% walk rate here with an 11% barrel rate. So I'm not super thrilled about that. Does have a 440 ERA with his 375 XFIP. So perhaps some positive regression coming for him. And he does have good whiffs. I do like the ground ball stuff against the left-handers with a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball, but he's got a 38% line drive right there. So that, that's got to kind of take you off. Um, so with Goldschmidt, Arenado, Contreras, and Jordan Walker, too, from the right side, all these guys hit lefties very well. And the left-handed sort of reverse split problem that Gore is exhibiting this season, I, I got to kind of come off of this. Even though I do like the price tag, and I do, of course, like the ownership too, really not the matchup I want to go after, um, you know, outside of exposures of Mackenzie Gore with here tonight necessarily. Miles Michaelis on the other side, uh, yeah, like he'll, he'll pop every once in a while. And we talked about this um you know, in, in the last start where I said, I just don't think he's very good. I never play Michaelis anymore. Uh, he's got a 16% K rate. He's got a 25% chase rate and 86% contact rate with a 26% line drive rate. There's just no chance, given how I evaluate pitchers, that I go anywhere near this guy. I don't care what he's priced. But eventually, like, guys will pop for a big number. And that's what Michaelis did in his last outing. I believe it was right before the break. Um... In tournaments, you kind of needed him, and you know he he'll do that on occasion. He'll pop for a 25 or pop for a 30 or something, and they'll win the game. He went seven innings against the White Sox, struck out six, didn't give up any runs. But the three starts before that gave up four, gave up five, gave up two. Two starts before that gave up gave up six, gave up five. You know, so um, he is super high variance anymore and I've got no interest in playing him because I don't think he's very good so no thank you he doesn't walk people necessarily but when he is bad he floats the two-seamer and he gets right onto the barrel um and he just gets picked apart left and right with batting average and like he'll give up crooked number after crooked number so uh no thank you on Michaelis um, he pops every once in a while, but he qu very quickly regresses back to who Michaelis is. You cannot pitch to this t much contact and uh, succeed at it at an outsized rate in the bigs you know, with those types of you know seven innings, six K, no earned run performances. So no Michaelis. Um, give me some of the Nats from the left side. They're cheap enough with like a Jamer, Luis Garcia. You can play Corey Dickerson. You can play C.J. Abrams. They've been leading him off a little bit recently. And you can play like a Dom Smith, who's shown a little bit of pop, even though he's sole first base. Not my favorite there, but uh, you can play some Washington stacks. They're kind of off the board and very much playable going after Michaelis because, I mean, frankly, I think he stinks. But once again, this is another weather game that you got to keep an eye out for. So, um, you know, we'll have to watch for that. All right. Elephant in the room here. Yankees at Coors Field tonight. Carlos Rodon on the mound for them. 8,500. I don't think this is the craziest play, to be quite honest. Um, I'm not going to do it because I'm personally still in, in wait-and-see mode with Carlos Rodon. At 8500 I think the price tag is fine, but we know he's a very high upside strikeout arm. Um, I'm not going to do it because it's Coors Field, and I just want to see, not like I'm like scared of playing pitchers at Coors or anything, but I'm still in, you know, let's... Let's get Carlos Rodon, you know, with a few starts under his belt before we start getting jacked about playing him at Coors Field. Um, I'm mostly okay if you land on correlated teams here. If you need to get different with the Yankees, because you're going to need to get different if you're playing the Yankees, you can play Carlos Rodon. I'm mostly okay with it because this is the Rockies, man. This is a an absolutely pathetic offense against left-handed pitching, despite the fact that they've got eight right-handers in the damn lineup. That should hit left-handers very well. They have a 64 WRC plus with a 26% strikeout rate and a 146 ISO here. 289 WOBA playing all your games at Coors Field is uh, is awful. Um, so this team is very attackable with a super high upside strikeout arm. And Carlos Rodon, he could go six innings. He could strike out nine here, and that wouldn't be a you know totally shocking at all. Um, so I think this is, at very low ownership, of a fine construction to consider correlated teams. 
uh, would I go out of my way to be playing an 8,500 Coors Field pitcher, um, you know, without correlation? Probably not. But uh, he's got to be in play because he's got history at Coors Field, not necessarily a good, you know, good history. But, I mean, th- this offense is really, really poor. Um, they do have everybody back, of course. Chris Bryant, Elias Diaz. And C.J. Crone, of course, are all, you know, they're mostly their power hitters, if you want to call Brian a power hitter. Zeke Tovar has been fantastic. Really looking forward to him continuing his early career success in the second half this year. They brought back up Alan Trejo from the right side at second base. Do still have Brenton Doyle patrolling center field, 3,300. Wish they'd totally get rid of Jerry Profar. He's been terrible. And the only lefty they're going to have is Ryan McMahon. So they'll, they will platoon. But it's still a bad offense. Um, now, it'll be warm at Coors Field. You can always play the Rockies. At very playable price tags, Bryant, Diaz, Crone in particular, uh, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, certainly Zeke Tovar as well. You can get to stacks here, um, but I think Carlos Rodon has to be in play a little bit as well. Uh, Austin Gomber at 5,500 is a total non-starter. Uh, not doing this at Coors Field. He's got a 10% barrel rate. His last five starts have been actually pretty serviceable for him, but there's no DFS up upside for him at Coors Field in this particular matchup. They're only going to have probably one lefty in the lineup, and it's Anthony Rizzo. Um, and Gomber's even given up a lot of production to left-handers, too. Three and a half homers per nine, 42.5% hard contact, 370 ISO to the lefties so far uh, this year. So no thank you for Gomber. All of the Yankees... And you play every single one of them, lefty included, whoever it is. So uh, no problems here. You just got to balance ownership with them. And playing some Carlos Rodon might be a way to do that. Okay, let's move on to Houston and the Angels. Uh, JP France on the mound. I don't like this price tag, 8500 in this matchup. Um, now, I know they lost Trout, right? They're still missing Brandon Drury, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can't play Shohei, so that kind of sucks. Um, but I, don't, I still don't want to play J.P. France. They've got some right-handers here, Taylor Ward, Anthony Rendon, Hunter Renfro, that I'm kind of scared of a little bit, to be honest. Not so much in the power, um, but in the contact and in the production, because J.P. France gives up 222 ISO with a 15% strikeout rate against right-handers, 36% hard contact, 080 ground ball to fly ball, and 2.2 homers per nine. So no thanks for J.P. France at 8,500 in this matchup, I do kind of like short stacks here of Taylor Ward, Mickey Moniak, Rendon, Renfro, if you want to get there. Throw in a cheap Eddie Escobar, dual eligible from the left side. I'm not super jacked about that, but he is a fine and playable fifth piece because he's super cheap in the middle infield. Uh, or corner infield, I guess, with third base. Um, so I'd kind of like to get to an Angel stack or two and target some JP France. Nobody's really going to be playing them because you can't play Shohei and Trout is gone, so... Nobody's going to be playing the Angels because, well, their offense is going to suck without those two. So um, even though, I mean, it, it's going to suck for DFS purposes, even though Shohei was still going to hit, of course. So I don't want anything to do with JP France. I would like to play some Shohei on the mound, too, uh, if I can make it happen. I would prefer Glasnow up at the top, but even at this, pre- this price tag, 10-9 for Shohei, he's still popping very hard in the value score, of course. we got to keep an eye out for the uh, projections, noise that comes in with Shohei, as I mentioned, ad nauseum this season. Um, and he's got some problems here. At 10-9, I'd, I'd prefer to just get to Glass now. But both of these guys up above 10,000 have very serious warts and super attackable uh, metrics here. Shohei, he's got a 10.5% walk rate and a 10.5% barrel rate. Like These are attackable figures, and we normally go after guys. I've said in this video here today that I'm staying off of guys that have walk and barrel rate combinations north of 10%, you know, like Michael Kopech, for example. Um, and Shohei falls into that category. Even though he's got the 30% Ks to both sides, he's far more expensive than a Michael Kopech. Um, you know, not that we're directly comparing the two or anything. I think Shohei on the mound is, is really kind of figuring it out a little bit. He was slumping, um, and he's probably going to be far better than this 10% walk rate, 10% barrel rate are suggesting going forward but that said he's still 10-9 and this is a 14 game slate I generally like to pivot to the mid-range and slightly cheaper pitchers on full slates like this because there's more relative upside for the price but that doesn't mean that Shohei is a bad play or anything like that if you can get up there and you want to play Shohei and like a Paul Blackburn or somebody who we'll get to in the next game I think that's fine and 
that reduces the you know out the, the exposed price tag that you have to your pitchers, of course. But um, overall, this is a tough offense to go after, right? Houston with just a 21% K rate, still missing Jordan Alvarez, of course, and they're still very right-handed heavy, not creating a hell of a lot, but still tough to strike out with Do- Mo Dubon, Alex Bregman, and Kyle Tucker up at the top of the lineup. Um, my favorite here, if I'm going to play like a leverage piece from Houston, it's definitely just Kyle Tucker. Uh, Alex Bregman is playable. I'm not going to go out of my way to do this, but he's much better against right-handers in terms of power than he is against lefties. And he's 4,000 third base. I think that'd be okay if you play a a short little three-man. It's not the worst thing in the world with like a Yiner Diaz behind the plate or something like that. Um, Not necessarily thrilling, of course. And we just got to side with Shohei most often. But got to be aware of a high walk rate and high barrel rate. Um, He might not go a full six and seven innings that you kind of need out of a guy at this price tag. So, and certainly at that ownership. So that's kind of how I'd like to approach that. Um, I do like Shohei. I don't like JP France at all. Maybe some short angels pieces and, and a piece here or there from the Astros. That's pretty much it for me from this game. This is a hitter's ballpark. So I don't want to play pitching a lot, uh, even if it is a, a really good arm. Okay, let's move on. Twins and the A's here. Kenta Maeda uh, on the mound. Here's the other guy at 7,700 to Brian Bayo that you can play. Now, we're seeing him only, Kenta Maeda, here at 12% ownership so far, and I think this is a ridiculously low number given the matchup. Um, Now, he's had three starts since he came back, and uh, two of them against in really good matchups, right? He had Detroit, where he came out and struck out eight in five innings and didn't give up anything, walked just two guys. Then he had... um, Kansas City, in his last outing, went seven full, struck out nine, gave up just one run, walked one. He had Atlanta, of course, super difficult matchup, sandwiched in between there, where, you know, it's not like he was bad. Uh, From a DFS perspective, yeah, maybe he was bad. Struck out just four and five innings, gave up two runs. But from a real-life perspective, that's a serviceable outing against Atlanta. Um, So, a tough spot sandwiched between two really easy spots in Detroit and Kansas City. And this is another really easy spot. So I've got no problem playing a lot of Kenta Maeda. I think you can get leverage to the upside on him um, and and play a good bit here. 25%. Like, this is a good value score for somebody in this range. We're getting a full 2.1 point per dollar on him. And that's reflect, reflected in the value score north of 33 here. So really strong number uh, in the early projection delta for... Um, Kenta Maeda and the early, you know, Arsenal values are are pretty encouraging, even though he was out for a little while and he gave up a 10 spot in three innings against the Yankees before he got hurt. So given that, um, everything still looks pretty good for the most part, right? 6% walk rate, 8.5% barrel rate. These are fine numbers. He's always been very efficient early in the count and he's got good chase with the split here. So uh, I've got no problem going after Kenta Maeda and playing a lot of him against Oakland because they're terrible. Um, if you do want to get to an Oakland piece, it, it'd just be like a one-off, maybe a short stack, Seth Brown, Brent Rooker, I don't know, a cheap Tony Kemp or a cheap Tyler Soderstrom behind the plate. Uh, he's a high upside catching prospect for them. I think about 280 in the PCL. Decent power numbers, um, but a good upside hit tool for them that they're going to bring up to debut this evening. He's at the stone minimum 2,000. If you want to play short stack like that, I think that's fine. They need some more catching production or production out of their out of their catchers, I should say, because uh, Shea Langa Leader has been um, underwhelming, to say the least. In any case, would just be short, cheap stacks for the A's for me, but I don't really want to go after Kenta Maeda here. Um, but it would be a Seth Brown, Brent Rooker, Soderstrom type of stack if I were to do it. Paul Blackburn... I like him at 5,300. I think he's got damn good numbers here, to be quite honest. 24% K rate, 7.5% walk rate, 65% strike one, and 31% chase. He's got a 10% swing strike rate. This is fine. And 27% CSW, also fine. He's not walking anybody, and he stays off of the barrel here at 6%. I, I have no problems with these plate discipline numbers, and batted ball figures are pretty damn good, too. Hard contact figures, sub-30% to both sides. He's got good soft contact to the right side at 21%. Not so much to the lefties there at just 13%, but he doesn't give up a lot of power necessarily. 
200 ISO to the righties, but kind of noisy there because he's got just an aggregate 148X ISO. So overall, at 5,300, I think he's underpriced in this particular matchup. The Twins are awful, man. Like, this team strikes out at a 27% clip against right-handers, 103 WRC+, plus, and this game's in Oakland. They'll hit for a little bit of power, but they strike out, and this is a bad, bad offense. So I want nothing to do with them tonight. Um, maybe a Joey Gallo or something at, like, 3,000, but he'll probably be in the 8 or the 9 hole. I don't want to play really anybody else, Correa or Buxton. Uh, Kirilov lost his outfield eligibility. He's 2,400. Now you got to play him at sole first base, so that stinks. I don't particularly want to play Max Kepler, even at 2,700. No thank you on Donnie Solano at 26. So they're cheap. They'll pop in value a little bit as filler pieces, but I don't really want to be dealing with this uh, for the most part. I'd rather just play Blackburn at very low ownership. I think, at, I mean, certainly at this value score, this is a smash play down here. Um if these projections persist. So uh, fundamentally, I've got nothing wrong, and projections are kind of agreeing here. So if he stays, if his ownership stays pretty low, I think he's a really, really good spot to get different on the mound and get cheap so you can play some really expensive teams like Atlanta with the Yankees or something like that. So I think that's very playable construction. Pitching only, you know, mostly for me, outside of a, a few Oakland pieces, maybe a one-off Twins piece here or there, but... Um, not for the most part. I, I like pitching here. All right, last game of the night, Eddie Rodriguez and Luis Castillo for the Tigers and the Mariners. 9700 for Eddie. I think he's a little overpriced. We've gotten kind of carried away with the price tag for Eddie. Um, now, he had a, a stretch there that was really, really strong for, however, what, five, six games, where he's just north of 30 points every damn outing, uh, striking out guys left and right. Going deep. Right, eight innings, seven innings, five and two thirds in a tougher matchup against Baltimore, but eight innings, seven innings. Um, really good to see Eddie get things back together a little bit here. The plate discipline at 26% strikeout rate, 6% walk rate, 66% strike one is all really strong. 29% CSW. Um, looking for a little bit of regression to come to him because he's not that good. He's not a 27, 28% strikeout guy. Um, I think he's going to see some regression there. He does have a 260 ERA with a 340 XFIP, right? Run delta there. He's got an 81% strand rate. That's going to come down, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I don't really like the price tag here necessarily, even though this is a very, very good matchup. Seattle is just as bad as Minnesota and the Rockies against left-handed pitching. 26% K rate for them. Break-even WRC plus creation. Buck 50 ISO there. A stone average offense top to bottom against righties and lefties so I like going after them with an above average arm and Eddie is that I just don't like the price tag for him 11% on the ownership here in the early going I think is probably a bit aggressive but I don't really have a problem with landing on anything in this range I don't particularly want to be getting leverage to the field with this number but it's not like 11% is a, a terribly high figure for a 14 game slate I got no problems getting there um, I mean, obviously, if I had to choose between Eddie and Luis Castillo, I'd just play Luis Castillo. He's 800 cheaper. I think the Arsenal's better. I think he's a better arm, even though he's got a susceptible, and I say susceptible, but it's pr a pretty bad change up here. Um, the problems to left-handers are really rearing their head again, and that makes it really difficult for me to get super excited. Riley Green is back for Detroit here. This is a good ballpark, of course. Um, you know, but it's, so it's not like I want to go out of my way and stack the Tigers here necessarily, but Riley Green solidifies the left-handed presence at the top of their lineup here. And he's not a total, he's actually their best all around hitter. So with him back, I've really got, um, a bit of trepidation going after this team with total impunity. Like I have really been doing all season with right-handers. They're awful. They don't create a lot and they strike out a lot. Don't hit for any power or hard contact. Can't get on base, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but with Riley Green back, like he's been out for a while, and he's really not been able to contribute to those pretty terrible numbers. Now, he does strike out, of course, and he's still attackable. It's not like Detroit is not attackable at all. Because Luis Castillo still has pretty outsized K stuff. It's just that he's got a bad change up here, and he gives up power to the left side, 190 ISO, with an 085 ground model fly ball. He comes in three quarters, and it's a pretty fishy mechanic for him to be um, 
you know, coming in at that arm slot with a bad changeup. So I really wish he'd fix that, but I've got no problem getting some exposure to him. He's similar to a couple of these other guys in this upper range. I mean, this is an out-of-control high value score for him. This median projection so far is very, very high for somebody at sub-9,000. So um, at 20% ownership, I've got no problem coming in over on this, even though I am concerned about the bad changeup and maybe like a Zach McKinstry, Riley Green, Kerry Carpenter type from the left side for Detroit. But like I said, this is still in Seattle, and on a 14-game slate, I'm not going to go out of my way to be targeting one of the better arms who's got really, really good suppression and K stuff. So um, probably some negative regression still coming for Luis Castillo, but I like playing him when he's sub 9,000. I don't like playing him when he's up above 10,000. So uh, I've got no real issue getting to some Luis Castillo. I think the ownership here is is pretty attractive. So do I want to play some some Tigers? Uh, well, I don't want to play Riley Green at 4,800, really. Uh, my favorite would be a Zach McKinstry because he's dual eligible and leading off. He'll hit some ground balls, um, so that batted ball profile plays into his strength a little bit against uh, Luis Castillo's slight fly ball lean against the left-handers. And Kerry Carpenter at 3,200, it's a, a fine price-adjusted play here. Um, those would be my favorites, maybe in a Kiel Badu or something, but he hits a lot of fly balls, so I'm not super jacked about that necessarily, but... Any left-hander is really in play against Luis Castillo. So that's kind of how I'd like to play this game. Pitching mostly. I don't want to play any Seattle. Um, you can always play Julio. He's 4,800. Okay, we can you know, start to talk about that. You can play Tay Oscar. But you need guys, when you're playing Tay Oscar, you need guys to give up high barrel rates because Tay Oscar strikes out a lot. And um, you know when he makes contact, it goes a long way. He has a high barrel rate himself, but you need guys that will give it up too. So not my favorite there. Gino Suarez is still very cheap at 2700 You could play some of these guys if you need a cheap stack and you want to take shorts on Eddie. But again, one of the better arms, I don't really want to be doing that with a below average offense in general. So mostly just pitching here for me. One-off pieces here or there where they're very well priced. Um, you know, Kerry Carpenter, Julio Rodriguez types. So uh, I believe that is it. It is. So let's quickly go over a review. I think we've been going pretty long here. San Francisco and Pittsburgh. Uh, no raw stripling here for me. Maybe a little bit of Rich Hill. Um, some Giants. Yeah, oh, okay, sure. If you want to get to some, you know, really cheap Austin Riley, Wilmer Flores types, J.D. Davis is fine. Something like that. A little bit of Pittsburgh maybe too. Jack Sawinski, Brian Reynolds, Henry Davis. But that's pretty much it. Um, not super interested in this game. Don't like the ballpark on a big 14 gamer. Sandy Alcantara and Dean Kramer from Miami and Baltimore. Sandy is in play, I think, or starting to get in play at 6,800. Um, you can play some Miami correlated teams too. I like going after Dean Kramer. I do not respect him at all. No Kramer for me. Very little Baltimore because I still don't like going after Sandy. Um, because he suppresses very well. I, I think Gunner at 4,600 is okay. And, but everybody else is still kind of expensive for this particular matchup because Sandy doesn't give up a lot of power necessarily. If you want a full stack against Sandy, that's how I would play it with Baltimore uh, rather than trying to homer hunt or anything like that. Arizona and Toronto, uh, no pitching here for me because Ryan Nelson doesn't strike out anybody and he gets Toronto. And Chris Bassett, I think, is bad. Um, he's good against righties, but he's horrible against left-handers. And they got a lot of uh, pretty capable left-handers that they are going to platoon with uh, over here in Arizona. Unfortunately, they're mega expensive, so kind of off of full stacks here for the D-backs, um, but one-off pieces and short stacks from the lefties of the top three is, I think, certainly in play, and pretty much everybody is in play for Toronto. Dodgers-Mets, I like the Dodgers if I could make some happen against Verlander. He's just not throwing it past anybody and can't get ahead early in the count, so uh, I don't want to play him, certainly at 15% ownership or whatever he was coming in at earlier. Uh, yeah, 15%, no thank you. And... I don't really want to play the Mets either because I like Julio Urias, and I think he's an interesting tournament pivot if you need to get a little bit contrarian on the mound. Looking for a bounce for both of these guys, so I don't really want to go after offense necessarily, but um, don't want to play Verlander at all, at all because this is the Dodgers. Milwaukee and Cincinnati, maybe a little bit of Corbin Burns for me. No Graham Ashcraft whatsoever. I'm probably just going to stay off the of Cincy here tonight. Uh, and give me a lot of Milwaukee. I do like them here uh, against Graham Ashcraft. White Sox and Atlanta, zero Michael Kopech. And very little of the White Sox, maybe a Luis Robert or something. Uh, $6,000 one-off is kind of a tough ask, however. Against Charlie Morton. 
And some Charlie, yeah, but I'll probably end up coming in under here. Everybody from Atlanta, though, uh, the walk rate and the barrel rate are way too high for Kopech. This is in Atlanta, and he's a fly ball pitcher against a kind of ground ball lean hitting team over here in Atlanta. So I, I think you could see Atlanta put up a real crooked number here tonight. However, we got to consider that their offense is not going to be this good all season long. Uh, if it is, I mean, they'll be the best offense in the history of baseball. So um, the only reason I say that, like, we got we got to be careful of regression for Atlanta. But this is a very, very good spot. I'm not sure it's going to come here. Cleveland and Texas, hard for me to play Cleveland on a full 14-game slate. Um and impossible for me to play Aaron Savali against Texas. No John Gray for me either. So you could play a couple of Cleveland pieces, but Josie is, you know, 6,000. So that's kind of a tough sell. Everybody else is okay from the left side. Um, do I want to go after John Gray? Not, I don't want to go out of my way, but uh, I think it's in play if you mix in some pieces here or there. Texas, yeah, if you could make it happen, but they're super expensive too. Much rather just play Atlanta. Boston and, and the Cubs. Brian Bayo's, um in play here for Boston for me. I'm less on the offense here for Boston, even though historically I've liked going after Kyle Hendricks. I think he is really, you know, kind of figured out the changeup. Um, it's still an excellent pitch, and not that the changeup was bad historically or anything, but it's I think he's gotten the value back and, and really found it this season. So uh, I don't want to play him because it doesn't have any upside, but um, it kind of takes me off of Boston a little bit here, and I'm kind of off of the Cubs too because I – Respect Brian Bayo's ground ball stuff for sure. Tampa and Kansas City. Tampa definitely, but we got to worry about weather here. Uh, no Alec Marsh and all the glass now that I can get. But he's got a 17% barrel rate in an eight sample start here, uh, or an eight start sample, I should say. Um, so we got to be careful of that. That's a pretty worrisome figure. I mean, kind of shocking that somebody on the slate has a higher barrel rate than Michael Kopech. But it is Tyler Glass now. This is a good strikeout matchup because uh, Kansas City is terrible. But, you know, we got to be careful of that. Washington, St. Louis. Um, I'm going to stay off of whoever Washington is going to throw tonight. I do like a little bit of the Cardinals. You want to play them? I think that's fine. Certainly if it's Trevor Williams. Once again, we have to keep an eye out for weather here. But zero Michael is for me. Uh, I think Washington is in play as well where they're well-priced. Uh, I like offense a, a decent bit in, in this game. Yankees, Colorado, of course, the Yankees. Maybe a little bit of the Colorado Rockies, too, where they were well-priced. C.J. Crone, Chris Bryant, uh, something like that. Zeke Tovar, Elias Diaz. But Carlos Rodon is very much in play because the Rockies are horrific against left-handed pitching. Houston Angels, uh, very little Houston for me. I don't want to go after Shohei on a 14-gamer, but I might come off of Shohei at 10-9. He's got some question marks for me, even though I do think he's turning the corner on the mound, getting out of this little slump here. Um, I don't really want to go after him, but I might not want to play him because uh, I want to see the uh, the walk rate and the barrel rate really come down before I get super jacked about 10-9 in a 14-game slate. Maybe some short angel stacks against J.P. France. He's a hitter's ballpark down here uh, in L.A., and I think that's playable with a, a couple of the guys at the top of the lineup, Ward, Moniak, Rendon, Renfro, maybe an Eddie Escobar as a cheap filler. Uh, Minnesota and Oakland, p pitching mostly for me. I, I really like Paul Blackburn. I, of course, like Kenta Maeda against Oakland, but if you need to get super cheap, I think Paul Blackburn is just underpriced here. Um, and this is a really good value play. If his ownership stays pretty low, I think it's a, a damn good play here tonight. And that'll help you get to a Shohei or a Tyler Glasnow or, or something. You know, full stack, you know, the, the Braves mix in three Yankees or whatever. Interesting construction there. And mostly pitching in the late game here for me as well uh, with Eddie and Luis Castillo on the mound. I'm kind of off of Eddie, but I don't really have too much of a problem playing some of him. It's just the price tag uh, that I'm kind of concerned with. But, it, you know, the fundamental matchup really says otherwise. Seattle is bad against left-handed pitching, and Detroit is Detroit. I'm kind of off of Luis Castillo a little bit just because of the addition of another lefty at the top of the lineup in Riley Green. Uh, for the Tigers back, but um, I don't know. I think getting a, a good bit of Luis Castillo, he still has plenty of upside here, and the value score for him is just off the charts high here. You rarely see a value score pushing 50, and that's what we're getting here for Luis Castillo so far. So um, that's kind of where we stand with everybody on the breakdown. Uh, good luck to everyone here on this big 14-game main on a Friday, and happy second half. Let's get it.